Hello, everyone. I'm Tina Gabrielson. I'm a professor of political science at the University of Wyoming in Laramie, Wyoming. Um, I generally teach courses in political philosophy, and so American political thought is often one of those. Um, I've been a state judge for We the People a couple times now, and uh, this is my first time at the national level. It's exciting. Um, I'm sure that we uh, wish it might be in person instead of virtually, um, but we'll just deal with whatever bumps along the way come up. Good afternoon. My name is Barry Anderson. I'm an Associate Justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Uh, I'm actually the Senior Justice on the court, which um, doesn't mean much, just means I've hung around for a long time. Um, I have a long, long history with this program. Um, I started out as an assistant coach for a, a team from Hutchinson, Minnesota that made it to the national competition several years running. Um, and then the last couple of decades, I've had the privilege of judging um, on a regular basis at the national competition. And I always enjoy these weekends. It's always great to have these uh, conversations about the Constitution and Bill of Rights. It's, uh, it's a highlight of my spring. And I'm thrilled that you're with us today. And I'm really looking forward to it. Tandy? Uh, and hi, my name is Tanya McConnell. I, for about 20 years, I was a professor of history at Columbia College in South Carolina. And about three years ago, I wanted to do something harder, so I started teaching eighth graders in Orangeburg, South Carolina. And uh, those of you who, are, who have been in the eighth grade would, would probably remember that that was a tough year for you, and it was a tough year for your teachers. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here with you today. Um, we are your unit one judges, as you probably know. But, I, but before I go down that track, I need to uh, ask you to introduce yourselves and your teachers. Would you uh, tell us who you are, please? Hi, my name is Trinity Powell. Hi, I'm Brittany Atkinson. And I'm Jaden Lyon. We are seniors at Laurel High School. Uh, and our teacher is Mr. Deming. Uh, well, it's uh, great to be with you. Uh, let's get down to business then, shall we? Uh, Unit 1 is about the philosophical and historical foundations of the American political system. We're asking question 3. Aristotle asserts in the politics that it is not the form of government ruled by the one, the few, or the many that matters most, but rather the ends of government that are most important. Where in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution did the framers set forth the ends of government? How did the framers differ, if at all, about the ends of government, uh, about how the ends of government should be prioritized, and which of the ends of government set forth in the Declaration and Constitution appear to have set the highest priority today? Uh, please begin. Aristotle's beliefs shaped the beliefs of the framers of the United States Constitution and the early government of the United States. Therefore, throughout early American history, the leaders of our country paid great attention to the ends of government. Each of the early documents sets forth the general purposes of the government or the ideals the government is meant to uphold. The Declaration of Independence asserts that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. At that moment in history, these inalienable rights and the protection thereof serve to be the ends of an ideal government. The Constitution insists that they will establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. The framers believed that freedom, safety, and security for themselves and future generations should be the ends of government. However, not all of the framers agreed on this. The Federalists, such as Alexander Hamilton and James Madison, believed that the ends of government should be more related to the success of the country, the unity of the states, and the power of the central government. While the Anti-Federalists, such as Samuel Adams and George Mason, believed that the ends of government lay more in the happiness and freedom of the people. Federalists insisted that the national government should be strong to protect the country. Anti-Federalists believed that the private rights of the people were much more important, and that if a government was not to protect these rights, then it was not a proper government. The original ends of government can be narrowed down to the inalienable rights of life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, justice, general welfare, and security. However, the majority of people are unaware of these purposes of our government, so these ideas have lost power both in the minds of the people and in the actions of our representatives. As George Santayana said, those who do not remember the past are condemned to repeat it. 
This means that if we cannot recall the purposes that our government should be working towards, we'll, we will be caught unaware as it defies those same purposes. Despite the fact that these original ends are losing power, this panel believes that life or safety is currently the most, most prioritized end of government. Today, the federal government continues to restrict the rights of the people, most notably in the case of the current restrictions on the First Amendment rights due to the ongoing pandemic, such as the banning of religious services. The ideals that our government was founded to protect are becoming lost in a muddy haze of political workarounds because in part, the people remain ignorant as to why and how the government came to be and the ideals it is supposed to protect. In ancient Greece, Aristotle had grown used to shifting government infringing upon the rights of the people, such as when Socrates was sentenced to death by an unjust court, which prompted much of Aristotle's political sciences dialogue. This shift in government power and political opinion cost Aristotle his livelihood and safety and helped shape his opinions about government. Our representatives perpetuate the idea that we will still stand for our original ideals, but in reality, the federal government continues to strip away and infringe upon our rights. The Bill of Rights enumerates rights that the federal government must protect and cannot infringe upon. However, even in places as close to our capital as Virginia, legislation is being put into place to restrict the rights guaranteed by the Second Amendment. Most of these infringements are for the protection and safety of the people, such as the recent addition of a red flag law. But, as Benjamin Franklin said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. As our government continues to be led the way it is, the legitimate ends of government are losing importance and being overturned. We now open ourselves up to questions. Uh, indeed, thank you. You have certainly given us a great deal to talk about and think about. Um, uh, Aristotle talks about, um, he uses the word eudaimonia, which we used to translate as the good life. Uh, of course, that's what he was, he saw as the purpose of government. Um, and, uh, uh, and yet we also find the, uh, in uh, Thomas Jefferson, this idea of the pursuit of happiness. First question, are those the same thing? Is the good life and the pursuit of happiness the same thing? It can certainly be um, construed that they are the same thing because living a good life means pursuing happiness as a person. So as well, as well, I believe that uh, pursuing happy, happiness and living a good life do not necessarily mean the same things because there are always hardships in a person's life that they have to go through even against their overall joy in life and it essentially is better to live a life that you have your downs which makes your uh larges more better yes and it is it is good to live a good life and pursue happiness there do have to be some rules though you can't just do totally whatever you want all the time though in that case, let me follow up with one very quick question. Is this pursuing the good life, pursuing um, happiness, is that something that, want, that has to be an individual act or is that something that communities do together? Do you, have, do you need a community to pursue the good life? I think that it can be an individual pursuit and a community pursuit at the same time. They don't necessarily have to be different things. And personally, Personally, I find happiness in my family and like being with people. So I think it is individual, but also with people in a, a and a community. And going along with what my colleague just said, uh, living in a community as most humans do, uh, building off of each other leads to a better life and a higher happiness rating from that. So I believe that bettering the community and having this betterment of the community is better for the happiness and overall joy of a lifetime than only going for yourself and the individual. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, here's my question for you. For the founders, one of the ends of a federal republic was avoiding the most common faction, that between the rich and the poor. How effective has the US Constitution been in this regard? I think that we have been fairly successful in that regard because after reading Aristotle's politics, I definitely noticed that what we consider to be democracy today 
is something that Aristotle regarded as polity, which was his ideal form of government. So I believe that we have done a very good job in avoiding this rift between the common or poor faction and the minority or the rich faction. And along with that, a lot of what uh, the poor faction, as it has been stated, uh, relies on the wealthy and more than just the trickle down effect of the economy. We, like for a lot of TV shows, uh, we look to the wealthy to provide entertainment for us uh, in a poorer faction. So let's talk a little bit about Aristotle. Um, over the course of the last 75 years, there have been a number of uh, reforms that come out of what political science and historians call the progressive movement. And I'm thinking here principally of initiative, referendum, and recall. I'm wondering what Aristotle would have thought about those reforms. Would he have approved or disapproved of those reforms? Would he, um, uh, what, what would he have had to say uh, about the wisdom of those reforms? Why or why not? It's hard to say for certain what Aristotle would have thought about these reforms because he had very um, mixed opinions about government in general, which is something else that I definitely noticed throughout politics. However, if the people were dissatisfied with these reforms, there are many ways that he would have advocated that they fight for their freedoms and their rights, primarily through reform of the system, which is something that we have historical examples of ourselves by petitioning our representatives or voting out representatives who haven't done what the people have wanted them to do. Two notable examples from the Civil War era were actually Senator Thomas Hart Benton of Missouri and Senator Sam Houston of Texas. And so we can see that there are many ways to um, contradict reforms that our government makes that we don't like. So I believe that it is difficult to say whether or not Aristotle would have particularly liked these reforms. However, he would have advocated for people to fight against them if people did not want them. Yes, and along those lines of reforming government, our Montana constitution, there's a provision in there that states that we should have a vote every 20 years about if we want to hold another constitutional convention and come up with another constitution. And I believe it was Jefferson that said that one generation should not impose a constitution upon the next generation. Uh, at the beginning, you talked about the, the, the difference between Federalist and Anti-Federalist, and you credited the Federalists with the idea that they wanted a, a successful, strong government, and the Anti-Federalists were focused more on the happiness of the people. Um, is it possible, and I'm just going to throw this one up, keep on doing that to me. <laughs> I get on a roll there. I'm going to start asking you know, quick questions, uh, quicker questions, I guess. Well, then I will go on. I will. What I was wondering was, uh, is it possible to be unhappy in a in a weak government, or to be happy in a uh, happy in a weak government? Or, or are those or would Aristotle have found those relevant to, uh, to us? But that's a question for another day. Really enjoyed our conversation. You're a delightful group of people. I wish we could just hang out together and talk about the Federalist, Anti-Federalist, and the Constitution at, at greater length than we can today. Uh, but uh, this has been a wonderful time together. I enjoyed our conversation. Uh, you brought a lot of really interesting and important ideas to the, to the table. So thank you so much for uh, uh, the work you've done to, uh, to get here today. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, Thank much. you for your time. I would just concur with uh, my colleague Tandy. Y'all did a nice job um, working through the different components of the question and working hard to collectively respond um, to each of the questions that we raised with you. And so um, I also appreciate your work very much. So I, uh, I echo everything that was said. The, the reference to the Montana Constitution uh, was really interesting um, and if Tandy hadn't taken up all my time so I didn't get a shot at you there at the end, I would have said, what would Aristotle think about that? I mean, you know, Aristotle believed and was very concerned about the rule of law and stability and so forth. And we're going to have a new constitution every 20 years. I, what an interesting, uh, what an interesting uh, discussion we had on that point. Um, 
uh, yeah, I thought it was it was quite good, and I and enjoyed your reference to the Anti-Federalists. Uh, they're an understudied and underappreciated group. We don't have the Bill of Rights without them, uh, and um, I thought it was a I thought it was a you know very strong performance, and I enjoyed being part of uh, um, part of the conversation today.